uh, let me just see here in, so just, I'm not sure if everyone saw in the, in the WhatsApp group, but we got a really positive answer from the editors. Uh, apparently we're gonna get a second answer. We got a first one from one of the editors who's more concerned like the editorial line and he said, I think Max, his name Max. He said that we can have the text actually, at, we can have any length really, which I think is a very dangerous <laughs> uh, gift to give us. Uh, but so I think we should try to keep it short each section, but if it you know, goes a bit overboard, it's not the end of the world. Uh, so that was a good answer. And he also said that they're very interested in us trying something else in terms of trying something out in terms of style and the way that things are presented. But the other editor of the journal will get in contact uh, in the next couple of weeks with us to talk about what can be done, how much they can change it, because they're still kind of figuring. Apparently, there is an artist who does the cover and the idea for the styling. So they will have to com like compatibilize our paper with this bigger project. So, but apparently it's, anyway, the, the answer was very, the reply was very good. So I think we can pretty much keep things as planned. Uh, I think that there, from what I've seen, there's already quite a lot underway. Uh, Rafael is already kind of already wrote a lot. I tried the first draft today for the introduction to the diagram. Uh, I know that Yasha is already has some bullet points for, for the introduction to the more, uh, uh, actually now that I, I'm trying to find this. Yeah, so basically he, he and Reza are writing about just an introduction to the approach and what we call objective phenomenology. Uh, so they are already starting to work on that as well. Uh, John, you said you're you're gonna try to condense some of the stuff from your second presentation, right? Yeah, yeah. I um, kind of went back. I think I want to zoom out just a little bit and kind of look at not just the way that B branches into B plus C, but the way it splits into both by using that history of the Mongolian Empire I kind of like touched on very briefly. And I think I can do it like in a very condensed fashion that doesn't necessarily like explicate how I'm translating that history into our language, but I can kind of like lay it out in a way that makes sense. Um, and then kind of like point towards other places that we'll be able to develop it down the road. Yeah, one thing that I wanted to, to talk to you about uh, that actually has to do with, with, with something that became a bit clearer to me now also about when I was writing this introduction to the diagram, uh, which is something that I think that since your, your text, I mean, I'm not sure between your, your section and Alain's section, because I know Alain wants to talk about uh, what sort of specific fetishism exists for mode B. Like I've been talking to him a lot and he has a really cool thesis that we can actually define, let's say a fetishistic structure for uh, at first, he, he said mode B and mode C, so commodity fetishism, but there is something like a power fetishism in mode B. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's that's where the whole idea of the sovereign is kind of like mode B's version of capital really comes in and plays strong. Yeah, yeah totally and, but I was talking to him and I said, because I know he likes anthropology and Levi Strauss a lot, and I said like, man, but you should also have a, like, why doesn't mode A have a fetishism? Like, why is it deprived of this? <laughs> and, and I had an idea that we, we started talking about that I think it's a cool idea, which is to say, you know, like, in our approach, we make a distinction between objective phenomenology, which is, let's say, displacing the I from the perspective of individuals to the perspective of some object that exists inside the logic, right? So. The fact that commodities look at other commodities, that's not fetishism. That's just a logical value. When you try to see capitalism from your standpoint, that's fetishism. And it's a kind of transcendental illusion in the sense that you're obliged. Like if you want to see from your perspective, the logical value, you need to, let's say, 
act as if everything is an object. So you fetishize objects and everything is a thing. So relations between things are how capitalism appears to us. But for capital itself, for value, this is not true. Like, and the logic of value doesn't make that distinction between things and people. It doesn't give a shit. Like people can be commodities, things can be commodities, Nat natural resources can be commodities. Like it doesn't matter, right? So talking about people and things, that's not the internal language of value. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, the that's external what... language. And that's what's called what we call fetishism. And I think what Alain Well, I think what makes sense on TB is that like the state doesn't differentiate between material in inert stuff in humans when it looks at things in terms of resources everything is a resource yeah but would you say that the, the state like when again i agree with you the state doesn't make that distinction treating mm -hmm. things as resources is let's say the inside language of the state right what that uh, scott guy calls let's say how the state makes things legible to itself okay. Like an internal language, yeah. Yeah, but there is the external language, which is how does the state appear to us? And I think that uh -huh. we can define it by saying that while the fetishism of commodities require us to force everything into the position of object, the fetishism of power forces us to put everything in the position of subject. So everything is a subject. There is like the, the right private person. I don't know how to say this, like the juridical person, right? Yeah, you know, like the, the the private. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and and objects have are private subjects in that sense. So, for example, yeah, we can talk about the, right yeah. objects have rights. Like you, you damaged property. Yeah, things like this. So, and then the fetishism of mode A would be the fetishism of the relation between things and people. Yeah. So, which would be precisely where like a critique of mysticism could come <clears throat> come in is where everything is like one in this simplistic sense is this kind of like yeah everything is related to everything like yeah. that's not how mode a works. well and that's also powerful in terms of trying to understand nationalism because what you see right now with conspiracy theories is a kind of like mysticism of ta where everything's interconnected with everything else built yeah, on it's this, a good like, point that's a good personality point. when you look at like you know i'm gonna go with trumpism but you can say with bolsonarismo or any of these other things right like you have this synthesis between like a community which is like synergistically interconnected and a strongman personality which kind of like embodies the sovereign and yeah and i think it this just kind of even... disregards capitalism right it like will it will address it as it needs to but it kind of like leaves it to the side sometimes we give tax cuts to the rich sometimes we go after big companies we just kind of deal with it as we need to but it's not yeah, really necessary. but i think that the the crucial point there the crucial analogy would be that the internal language of gifts and reciprocity it's true that it treats everything as persons right you can like nature is a person you negotiate with nature and so on but that's not the fetishism because mm -hmm. it, persons don't don't coincide with people or with things god knows what will count as a person for from a reciprocal point of view. But you can fetishize it by thinking that you need to always adopt the point of view of the relations. So there is a fetishism of A, which is, let's say- Yeah, whereas in TB, what defines being subject is being part of a limited set of subjects. Your subjects under a particular sovereign, there is like a, a boundary. Whereas the subjectivity of TA is like infinitely, everything is equally a person. Yeah, and, and again, I think we need to be careful there because the logic of reciprocity, it has its own kind of, people use this idea of personhood because it, mm -hmm. like Marilyn Strathern will say something like, well, while commodity fetishism reifies everything, turns everything into things, you know, reciprocity turns every, everything into people and persons. Uh, okay, you could say that, uh, so the form of an object is always the form of a person, just like the form of an object in capitalism is always the form of a commodity. Uh, so let's say you only real recognize nature if you can single out, classify its parts in terms of population of persons, like entities of all sorts that you can negotiate with, forces that want things and so on, right? But let's say, 
if you're not adopting that logic, you're looking at it from the outside. I think it has a lot to do with what you said about conspiracy because networks become this sort of fetishistic entry door. Like, again, it's a transcendental illusion. It's not a deformation, it's not false consciousness. It's the mm -hmm. best you can do from yeah. your own standpoint is to see networks, right? And to think that relations are connecting people. But if you're not allowing those relations to actually define what counts as people, you're just taking your empirical evidence as the people that count, that's fetishism because you're ascribing to the relations this sort of entry door into the world of reciprocity. So it does give us a sort of three types of fetishism, right? Um, which I think it's, it's an interesting thing. Why, why am I saying this, uh, John? Is because I'm not sure if Alain is going to cover this, but I think that some of one of the, of the sections that deals with the state uh, should have something about, let's say, the internal objects to the logic of the state that are able to see a lot, right? The privileged standpoints from inside that no, logic. That's actually really perfect. I think that's a really good way to, because I think that that uh, is a good way to structure the history when you look at what was actually, like what was being built by Genghis Khan and the actual institution was an apparatus to see his empire and to make decisions about flows and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Things mm -hmm. like turning rural areas into pasture so that the, the cavalry can move quickly and developing postal systems and unifying languages and metrics. Like they were ways of homogenizing to enable that kind of seeing that you're talking about. So yeah, yeah. totally. I think yeah, I think, really yeah. Why, why am I saying this? Because when I was writing this, this introduction to the diagram, I was talking to Rafael here, I realized that we have three critiques to Karatani. Uh, uh, one of them, two of them, in fact, are critiques to mode B because we're, we decided not to use it. So one is, let's say, just the critique, which is to say, well, mode D is not really, Karatani doesn't even use it that, that productively. It's kind of like, a, in Portuguese, we would say a bag of cats. Like when you have an, a bunch of properties that are not connected and you just put them all into one kind of collection. Uh, it's, a, it's a bag of cats of properties that he calls Modi mostly in order to be able to claim in a way that is consistent with the rest of his theory that there is a fourth mode of exchange that can har harbor a new society and you can kind of trust it, right? We kind of don't need that because we have this more experimental take on politics. So, so there is a critique of Modi. Then there is the idea that uh, we can substitute it for something which is more active. Uh, then there's a third point, which I think connects with this thing I was, was saying, John, which is we like a materialist question to Karatani would be where did he, like, how does he historically explain? that we can see these different logics. Like, yeah. because his theory is that there is a transcendental reduction that authors and specific thinkers did in order to capture the pure forms of these logics. But that's kind of suggesting that somebody just had an idea and did it in a piece of conceptual writing. It, does, it answers the question of who conceptualized a certain object. It doesn't answer how was that object constituted to begin with as a possible object for a conceptualization. And I think that we have two answers to this that, are, that need to go together. I think the strongest answer is that, uh, well, our theory of political experiments accounts for this in a materialist way, right? Political experiments, they challenge different aspects of social formations. And according to the Bogdanov thesis, that true interaction we learn about the world, by interacting with the social formation, we kind of abstract this object. So it's further confirmation that our substitute theory for mode D uh, is useful. It becomes useful, not as a kind of political prescription about the future, but because it gives the materialist basis for the modeling of A, B, and C. Mm. And second, we have also a different, a different answer which is this internal objects, right? 
meaning it, transcendental reductions are not done by transcendental subjects, by Kantian cognitive agents. They are done by objects inside those worlds. So you see the pure logic of, of mode C when you displace your position to that of the value form or, or the money commodity. You see the purity of mode B when you displace your position to that of the sovereign or some other object, right? So we have two answers. Like the big answer is that politics comes before the model of society. And actually that's not, a, and, and Dennis said this to me the other day and I think it's true, which means that Karatani's model is not an analytic model. It's a synthetic model. It's actually synthesizing a bunch of political modelings of social reality, which were separate. And he managed to kind of find this, a schema to bring them together, right? But the analysis itself happened before, happens in real political practice. And I think that there is something to be said about, you know, kind of a redescription of ethnography as a, in, at its best, having some political import or, you know, the very objects I mean, this is Karatani does goes as far as saying this that Hobbes could never have written the Leviathan if there wasn't the glorious revolution and the fear mm -hmm. of the, the total over kind of overthrowing of the of the state. Mm -hmm. Right. So either as reactive people or as sort of adventurous claims that other cultural or social groups or their cosmologies are true and rational or as, as the theorists of the first international, which Marx also was. So you can actually account for these things from the standpoint of the political processes that do the real abstraction of this object, right? I also think that that's where like, we can also look at TB as a space, like as a, a space that organizes and tries to solve certain kinds of problems and doesn't have to be reducible to the state. And that's where I think like problems of logistics, infrastructure, these kind of like categories that these big categories that Lefebvre gets into around like differentiating space and whatnot, like that's a kind of problem solving that we also need to experiment in. But you have to kind of like define the space by clarifying how it grounds the state without being identical to the state, I guess, is, is the challenge, I think. And that's where I think like the Mongolian history is so interesting because in growing so quickly, they developed a minimal logistical state that kind of shows like the bare bones lineaments of a state and doesn't have a lot of, it wasn't very hybrid in the way most states are with earlier forms of TA. If you look at like Roman history, for example, there are these constant kind of like alliances between different community kinship networks that like gradually like interconnected with the history of the state. And so we've taken this and similar with like even more so with like ancient Greek history. We've taken these as kind of like prototypes of what states look like, but they already often have a lot of like TA built directly into them. What's interesting about Mongolian history is you had the Mongolian empire on the one hand and the Mongolian nation on the other and Genghis Khan strictly divided them. And so you almost have this kind of like clear definition between where TA stops and where TB begins in this really interesting way. And because it grew so quickly, it also collapsed very quickly. So we kind of see how its crises developed in a very kind of crisp, clean way. So I think there's kind of ways to explore that internal language, those internal objects and the way kind of problems emerge within that space. Uh, and I think I think we, at this point I can do it fairly succinctly. <laughs> Since we're trying to uh, that, that would be really cool, man. But also I think that this is important because uh, so like if you were to like if we were to highlight in the big diagram the section that you're actually intervening on is is partially in the diagram and partially let's say before it. Right, because you're dealing with the formation of the Mongolian Empire, which is something that precedes the dominance of Mozi. Yeah, and in many ways, like it's in that period of transition from TB dominance to TC dominance, you know, and you see some kind of like immediate proto capitalist things happen 
even a kind of like early uh, mercantilist thing starts to develop in the Mongolian Empire before it collapses. So you kind of see the, the rudiments of what could have been Eastern, East Asian capitalism as opposed to Western Asian European capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, like you can definitely see that and you can kind of see where these logics, um, where you see like, you know, Genghis Khan is born into this small tribe even for like the people of the area where it's very much still like the nomadic norm. It's not even a fully developed kinship network. It's literally, he's in that very beginning of the Karatanian process. And by the end of it, they have an almost world-class like global economy. And so you see like multiple kind of like nice, it, 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 it's in a way it's more Hegelian than a lot of the history Hegel liked because the stages are just so abrupt and clear between like small tribal formation, tribal nation, net, uh, tribal nation, Mongolian nation, Eastern empire, global empire. And suddenly like all these dynamics keep shifting as you kind of move up each level. And each of those levels are sometimes only like a decade or two apart. <laughs> so it all moves really quickly. Yeah, I, I just think that like, uh, I'm kind of trying to suggest, I mean, the, the thing that I, how to put this, like, um, perhaps Alain will deal with this already and we don't need to worry about it. But I think that either his section or your section should, pro I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna, like, I don't think it's a necessary bibliography, but just for the sake of kind of an example, you know, this scene like a state text by that Scott, James, James Scott? I don't remember. You sent it to me. I haven't had a chance to read it. Yeah, I think uh, that it's, I think you'll find, I mean, just read the first chapter. I think you'll find it ridiculously on point. Like he pretty much tells a story of like basic state of, uh, formation as being the, the development in like in very different areas, like management of forests, establishment of common metrics uh, and things like this. But his, his theory is that all these things exist so that the world might become legible for a state. Yeah. So yeah. He's, he, he goes very, very, very close to the to this sort of objective phenomenology thing. You know, like uh, he talks about legibility, which is kind of a, I don't know, ambivalent word perhaps, but because it might overemphasize, you know, why things are uniform because they, or the written form or things like this. But mm -hmm. I think that his core idea is just kind of uh, the showing that what we associate with the strategy, with state strategies for organizing communities and so on are mostly connected to, to uh, making sure large territories are legible for some dominant community, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that idea of, that, that there are there is some that the state form is connected with making things legible to a center should appear somewhere because mm -hmm. part of our initial critique of Karatani is hinges on that that we can actually displace this theory of transcendental reductions that happen to theorists mm -hmm. to the theory of transcendental reductions that happen to objects inside those modes right there is an eye inside each mode that sees the objects of that mode, be them people, nature, or whatever, right? Yeah. So somewhere I think we should be able to add this because otherwise it will be, be missing. But from what you're saying, it seems like that, that's actually a like, particularly good case study to see this, right? Yeah, I'd be happy. Like, I mean, I'm sure uh, what Alon's looking at, I mean, if it makes sense, we should, take it from multiple angles but it definitely makes sense to look at like a concrete case of like something in history where there where there was a very intentional goal of doing that it gives like a good example of where mm -hmm. where that works so yeah totally i can i can work that in explicitly um i was wondering if you had access to that pdf that you sent out on the hexagonal logic because it was paywalled for me Ah, okay, I'll, I'll send to, it. I'll send it now on, on our. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to see what you know the 
it's totally bonkers. So <laughs> Sim, yeah. Yeah, I, I quoted it on the on the paper like as if it's like the clearest thing. I, I quoted it in, in, in the introduction to the diagram, but I'm getting used to these papers like where they lure you in the first third or so with like seemingly like accessible concepts and the next thing you know you're in Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The thing with this paper, uh, I really wanted to like take some time with it at some point. I think uh, we should have a, I mean, I really think we should have at least one meeting about it because if we're going to use, it seems to be a powerful tool for us. Yeah. So, and, and the guy is actually trying to do something that is, I mean, Guitar, he's a, a logician who's a friend of Badiou and is a Lacanian. And this thing is a development of a previous, previous work that he did <coughs> called on something he called specular logic, which is a logic that should, uh, uh, account for why changing positions uh, changes truth value of statements in accordance to Lacan's formulas of sexuality. So he wanted to kind of formalize the difference between the all and the non-all, that the whole Lacanian thing. And then he said, okay, now I'm gonna not satisfied. I'm gonna give you the logical structure of the real symbolic and imaginary. So he defines the logic for the real, the symbolic and the imaginary. Then he comes up with this structure that binds the three of them under the Boromian property. And if you travel around this structure, the, tru the, the, the language and the truth value of propositions change with it. So it accounts for paradoxes, contradictions, and so on, right? Nice. <laughs> and not satisfied, if you read part of this paper, you'll see that he starts from, uh, you know, there is this hexagonal structure uh, called the geometry of logical oppositions, which is uh, starts with Aristotle, which has the four values like for possibility, necessity, impossibility, and contingency. Then Apuleius, which is this other Greek, I think, logician, developed like a eight, uh, a, a, a six-sided structure. He saw, showed that there are not four values but six modes, and more recently, this French guy called Robert Blanchet uh, kind of started formalizing this hexagon of different kind of modes, uh, logical modalities. And he shows that this real symbolic imaginary Boromian object that he constructed covers the six logics, six modalities that Blanchet formalized. Huh. So yeah, he's not satisfied with doing like a Lacanian thing, which, you know, would please Lacanians, like, Oh, this this diagram has a Borromean property, blah, blah blah. But he he shows that the different logical modalities of Aristotelian logic are all sections of the thing that he constructed. So it's the guy. The he guy, it, like, yeah, he's sad. But that sounds dope. <laughs> yeah, but I, I I managed to follow up to I don't know page three. And then yeah, it no, just, it's gonna it's gonna kick me in the head, but it'll be getting used to to it more hanging out in this <laughs> yeah I, but i think we should try at some point kind of going through it and see what we can learn and, uh, i mean it opens up so many interesting uh um concrete research questions you know like actually especially like i think the big step for me that i want to explore is from from where like this diagram to the three semantics of paraconsistency on TAA, yeah. on TB, and intuitive on TC. Because I feel like if we can make that step like mathematically valid, then like that opens up like that's how you should organize data in a certain kind of way. And that's how you should organize like categories in a pretty interesting way. And then how they kind of like interconnect on these three co products. Yeah. It's also, you know, but there's a lot of really interesting, like uh, I think, like empirical implications of how to use this stuff once it gets it so if, I, yeah if I we can prove it all you know <laughs> yeah i mean i've been trying to look into this uh dennis i don't know what you think of this but uh you know like i, I even posted the question in the group and i think that people were right not to answer or try to because it's just a bit crazy but you know right now I, i'm not even sure if this will appear in the in the text we're writing but it could if we wanted to go into like 
I'd be willing to write like a, a section called an open question, you know, and kind of put the question to the universitarios, as we said, for, say importantly, get the aid of the, of the academics in a, you know, like a, a, who wants to be a millionaire kind of show, like calling the, your aid. Uh, which is this, like, uh, we know that we can account for maps between an intuitionist topos and a Boolean one, like a classical logic one, because we know classical logic is like a restricted case of the intuitionist one. That's kind of an okay, well-established idea. Uh, and we can account for the fact that if you go the other way, if you try to project intuitionistic statements onto this classical space, there are things that will have to decide their value in a kind of yes or no, true or false case where that's not the case for, for the intuition, intuitionistic space. So that's already something we can say. And that I think it already has traction empirically with the fact that let's say property language is more like a yes or no question. Whereas value logic is more like a degrees of equivalence thing. But when you try to account for the mode A, you get into a problem, uh, at least from where we stand right now, because the way we've been trying to, to describe mode A in terms of logic, something that Tiago and I have been trying to do, is that we, are trying to work with a kind of tree-valued logic, uh, where which has a kind of the easiest intuition for it is like a topological one, where you have one, a, one value maps two elements into the same neighborhood, into the same point. So you can never make them disjoint, right? So they are they are in the same neighborhood always. The second value maps them into different neighborhoods that have an intersection. Uh, so they have something in common. So they're, they're, they form a similar interior. And the third value maps them into disjoint neighborhoods with no intersection, right? Uh, and our, our take on this is that this can help to construct kind of weird spaces that mm -hmm seem very similar to the spaces that Levi-Strauss is trying to describe when he talks about dual societies. Uh, it accounts for things that uh, other anthropologists talk about in terms of different uh, cosmologies like animistic, uh, totemistic, anal analogic, and naturalistic societies, which would be Western ones. Uh, and in the case of capitalist formations where mode A is very restricted to like nuclear families, interest groups and things like this, nations. It accounts for Lacanian logic because Lacanian logic is all about there being the one, the other, and that point which is not, a, not allowing itself to be divided by in, in feeding into one or the other, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But we have two options here, like we can, think of these three values as if it's like true, false, and a sort of true and false, like both P and not P are fitting inside the same kind of statement, uh, which would be like paraconsistent like, or we can think of it as a sort of just three values of an intuitionistic space, like maximal, true, minimal, false, and something in between. Mm -hmm. If we think of it in, in those terms, I think the relation between the intuitionistic and the, and the reciprocal logic is easier. It's like you're filtering this infinite lattice of values by tree values. But if it is para-consistent, so if this middle value is not in between the other two, it's really neither of the two in any sense, right? It's kind of this contradictory value. Then the issue of how does intuitionistic logic relate to paraconsistent logic becomes important, and the literature on this is fucking crazy. What, but wasn't the the middle term like something in common? It wasn't completely. Sorry. Uh, 
you said that the middle term had some intersection, right? Like there, there was something in common. Yeah, we were, we're still thinking of this, but it would be something. So if you had like this here's, reciprocity here's my, function, right? It yeah. would be something like A and B uh, can, we, we, we were writing it like, like this, but I, I, I'm not, I don't think this is necessary. So zero would mean that you take these two things to be impossible to separate, right? They're the same. Yeah. If you get value one, it means that you have like A and B. You can even map, map this to this and map this to this, mm -hmm. but there will always be something here. So, so and then this two is, is, is disjoint. Yeah, so it forms like an interior in this sense. Okay. And this is like the same. And do, two would mean that you have A and B and you can actually map this into one thing and map this into another. Okay. Because couldn't I'm wondering if like rather than making a choice, wouldn't those be A plus C would be where the three term logic and the meet join kind of logic comes in, whereas A plus B would be paraconsistent. But, but what do you mean A plus B? This is not this is just internal to A. Forget the internal, other mode. Internal to A, but when you're when we're asking about like what happens when the two logics meet, like the translation between them, right? Yeah, but even before we get to that, like we don't even know what A is. So how can we even ask what A plus B would mean, right? So inside one logic, so just to mm -hmm. not make confusions, right? So forget A and B, just X and Y here. Right? Oh, sure, sure. I, I knew that those weren't A and B. I meant that like if the question is paraconsistent versus this other logic of like a, a maximal, a minimal, and something in between, right? That former one is the translation between Boolean and, and three term logic, that one problem. And the other problem is the translation between intuitionist and three term logic. So those are two different problems, right? Yeah. So the, the, before we ask, like, how would they map into each other? Because, I mean, we could accept perhaps that uh, when you map mode C, which has that, like, it goes from false all the way to true, moving between every possible value here, in a way, and A, you could say that A plus C is like the weak version. It's a way of mapping this contradictory value into, like, an intermediate value. And we could say yeah, that this, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. So this version here would be this version because it's kind of using this and this and trying to be the most expressive for both of them at the same time. Uh -huh. So things are inside or outside or neither inside nor outside, but in a sort of uh, more like a uh, in between kind of sense, right? This would even explain because 99% of structuralist theories of capitalism are actually dealing with this. Like Lacanian like saying that, yeah, you have like exchange value and use value, but value is this in-betweenness of what is neither inside nor out. Like all these guys saying those sort of stuff, they're trying to do this. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, and then they're struggling with this in one way or another. But that doesn't... Like we can't start really seriously talking about this before we know what we mean by this. If we truly mean this, true, false, and true and false, right? Because, and, and if we do mean this to be the logic of A, uh, the relation between intuitionist spaces like this one, where you have between true, false and true, have a bunch of intermediate values and the logic of you know having true false and both true and false uh it's an open kind of open question like if you look in, in the but two topics to i guess that's my question is why do we have to choose why aren't both of those interpretations valid one because under... they're not they don't say the same thing they don't say the same thing yeah i get they don't say the same thing but like when we look at like any existing social world, they're actually compositions out of all of these three transcendentals, right? Yes, man, so, but like you're going a bit too fast. Like if we don't know how we want to think imminently the logic of A, like are we claiming it is paraconsistent? If it is, is there a categorical treatment of paraconsistent toposis? Like we don't even know. Like is there such a thing as a paraconsistent topology? 
So there are serious problems if we claim that this is what we're this is what we're talking about. Like a bunch of formal difficulties we need to solve. Like what would it mean to have like a space that like if you take a part of it, it's external to this part. But if you take their conjunction, like if you take their envelope, this envelope actually treats everything as the same, right? So uh, in a lower level, in a lower resolution, you would say that this is two uh, in, a, in a higher resolution. In a lower resolution, looking at a higher covering, you would say it's the same. It's, it's weird, right? That there is a disjunction, discontinuity inside a point. Mm -hmm. And things like this, like I haven't found almost any literature on this. And it freaks me out a bit because we're <laughs> trying to construct something that uh, I, I'm, I'm betting my, well, my card. I think we just need to become controversial enough that like people have to research very consistent topoi in order to try to disprove us and then accidentally prove us correct. I, I like that hypothesis, <laughs> but I just wanted to make clear that like at the same time that these crazy ideas in a quasi formal way have made a lot of nice developments. Like I've been meeting Thiago every 15 days. We read a classical anthropology text and we try to fit it into this schema. And at least from our kind of amateuristic perspective, he, I mean, he's not an amateur, he's, a, he's an anthropologist, but from our crazy attempts, it's bizarre how much we can fit together like yeah things that are supposedly unconnected in anthropology like levi strauss's theory of restricted and general reciprocity his theory of dual forms of organization the the even the canonical formula of the myth then eduardo viveiros de castro theory of the amerindian societies we actually unify all of that so it looks very nice in a kind of quasi formal way, but we can't guarantee the formal steps because it would imply that certain these ideas exist, like paraconsistent topology or, you know, a categorical and therefore kind of intuitionistic because category theory is kind of at home at intuitionistic logic. An intuitionistic modeling of paraconsistency is that, is that a thing? Yeah. No? And, no, and we don't know. I see what you're saying, yeah. So uh, there are some really crazy problems that we, we might have to deal with at some point. And I mean, it's always cool because usually when you're going in a nice direction, you're obliged to come up with nice tools that didn't exist in the process. But yeah. this seems a bit too much. Like uh, I, I found some papers that show that there is, there is a relation between intu intuitionistic and paraconsistent logic, which is that a co-intuitionistic logic is paraconsistent, meaning the opposite of the intuitionistic space is gives you a paraconsistent space. And you kind of can get that feeling because it's like you invert the two clauses, right? You yeah. remove, you reintroduce the excluded middle, but remove the non-contradiction, right? Whereas in intuitionistic, you remove the excluded middle and kept the non-contradiction. I also uh, like it from like Marx's description of like early exchange being on the peripheries of different communities. You can kind of see like they were directly in opposition to each other in a weird kind of way originally. Yeah, I mean, th there's a bunch of interesting things we could follow. Like, for example, it would be crazy to have a historical materialist account of why we only know about three basic types of logic, intuitionistic, paraconsistent, and classical, because those are the three big social modes of domination we know. Like that would be like, can you be cheekier than that? I don't think you can. Like, uh, so- This is like Son Rather on like steroids. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah. Man. laughs> Whatever. Yeah. That would be like the, Son, Son Rather would come back to life. So uh, transcendental yeah. relativism. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it would go very far in that direction. Plus, that's what uh, I'm saying. We get controversial enough to piss off everyone to research the math for us because there's so much research that's like 
it, yeah, I mean, I totally agree. There's so much stuff that hasn't been researched because so many of these problems have come from different problem spaces in history and organizations. Yeah, so, so that's crazy. And another thing that I really like, which is uh, I think it would be the final nail in the coffin of uh, what still remains as the sort of last kind of magic trick in the bag of tricks of political thinker, communist thinkers today, which is, we were talking about this with Karatani, like they want mode A to save us all somehow. Like this is valid for Deleuze with nomadism. This is valid for Karatani. This is very for Zizek, you know, with Lacan's logic of the estimate having the, the kernel of revolutionary ideas. It's the only guy I know of that's not valid for is Badiou because, and why do I say this? Because uh, the, this logic here looks like, even though it's a consistent logic, it's a para-consistent logic, it looks as if you came up with a community that accepts contradiction. So it looks like there is impredicativity because there will be parts of this world that are neither true nor false, right? Or bo both true and false. So they won't fall under a predicate. So when people are looking for the common, looking for common ways of organizing, everyone, this is, we could account for why everyone looks for mode A, because it has, let's say the resources to have something unpredictable. But we would be able to add that this is not a kind of freely associating communistic logic. It's just, that it has that truth value. So it's not the same as exploring a new logical space or constructing positively uh, a generic subset of people. It's just a defined set, which you can count everyone who is inside of it, but it's a world where it's okay to say that both proposition P and its negation will apply to that set. So it's, it loses a bit of its kind of romantic appeal. We can actually, we would be able to account for why everyone tries to harvest this power of contradictions from mode A and why it, it's a limited power. It's not an infinite power that can take us any new place, you know, like, and I think that like current perspectivists people who think anthropology is discovering the salvation of politics. They trust exactly this point. Lacanians who think that, uh, you know, the estimate is like the kernel of the revolutionary subject. They trust the same point. Neo-rationalists who think that rules that revise themselves are gonna take us somewhere like un uncharted territory. They also trust the normative power of community. You know, so it's like the, it would be a, a, another polemical thing to say as if they're not enough, you know? So it would be interesting. It would be very nice if this is consistent, but there are these big formal challenges in the middle to make it cohere with the rest that I'm not sure how to deal with. I'm not sure, Dennis, if you ever looked into this. Uh, yeah, it's very ambitious. I don't know if... Uh... <laughs> I, I did find this one text while you were talking on trying to connect. There's this guy who's working on something called universal logic, which maybe it's not Jean Yves Bezio, is it? Yes, yeah, it is that guy, exactly. <laughs> he's a teacher he... in my university. Oh ah, really? Yeah, he's the head of my department. Okay, so do you know about this then? Like is it relevant to the Paraconsistent. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, but I, yeah, I never looked in detail into his work. I should email him about this. And uh, yeah, you should ask him maybe. But uh, I, I have this. My only comment on this is um, this idea that uh, that we kind of touched on the last one of our last presentations, which is. Um, the idea that certain, certain propositions are valid over a certain space is part of the um, 
I think part of the uh, the appeal of using topos theory, right? Like topos theory is all about um, generalizing set theory to the point where um, you can have locally true statements, whereas sets are have universal extension extensional differences, right? So like this set is different from this set because one set contains an element, not in the other. Um, the, the, in a topos, you have these, these locales where some statements are true, um, but only in that locale, right? And mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's like, context, it's very suited for contextual logic. So I wonder, in, so in the move from classical to intuitionistic, you get this move towards contextual logic or like location specific knowledge. Uh, I wonder what what is the analogous move when you go to um, you know this paraconsistent. That would I think that would be the the theory of the topos for paraconsistent. Like yeah. what does space what does space look like? Exactly. For example, yeah. one of the contributions we will have is this text by Tiago, uh, who which he already wrote in Portuguese. I just recommended that he translated it. I'm not sure if he's going to add anything, but. I was talking to him about the primer and this idea that we connected the power of money to see the value of other commodities to the internal structure of money. We show that well, because money can be divided into kind of homomeric parts, right? The same quality, but just changing quantity. The relation between money and another commodity can be expressed in terms of the relation of money to itself. Right? And then we were talking about this and he said, well, I think that we can actually say something similar about uh, what happens in, in kinship structures, not in the sense of homomeric relations of you know, qualitative uh, fixation and quantity changes, but in the sense of something we could call heterometric relations. So for example, a mother and her baby they don't form two. They form more than one, but less than two. Let's put it like this. So the relation of um, the baby is both outside of the mother and inside. Or in our case, we would write it as zero. Like at some point in these two sets, right? Or these two parts of the world, you can't disjoin them, right? And something about the two maps to the same point. Yeah. Uh, that makes the mother a special object in kinship relations, because you can express the alterity of people uh, with regards to one another in terms of the internal alterity of a mother to herself. Right, so constructing this sort of universal inequivalence, right? Like universal self-difference you can account for the differences between other things in terms of its own internal structure. Ah, it's interesting, yeah. See, like that would be the, the, the vulgar simplification of what this means. So there is something paraconsistent, like some paraconsistent flavor in the fact that there are propositions about, you know, the, the sort of mother baby unit, which you can't really place if they're talking about mother or baby, right? because there's some sort of constitution of the mother to the baby and the baby to the mother and so on. Uh, and because this internal structure is, let's say, self-different, you can express in those terms relations between the mother and other kinship structures, kinship positions, right? That would be like a matrilineal structure. It would also make a lot of sense of like the consistent attacks with the rise of states on matrilineal logics as a imposition of an, that new Boolean binarist logic on top. Yeah, because, because you see, like th that's where I would put A plus B because- mm -hmm. That's where like- uh, Patriarchy. Yeah, but, really but you see like patriarchy, what does it do? It finds a different object to occupy that position and have that prop, that paraconsistent property. The father is inside and outside of the family. 
but it's no longer the, the consanguinity that is defining, like mother baby, for example, as the, the, the hereditary kind of lineament of reciprocity, but the fact that the family unit has an instance that is both inside and outside. So the guy is both father to the family, so he's inside, but he's also, let's say, the representative of the state because he's, let's say, the worker, the citizen, and so on. So that would be, let's say, a mixed logic between A and its paraconsistent structure and state, which is classical structure. Like we state, could also account for uh, the the role of homo soccer then in terms of this too. It's the father's power to put someone in that position of the kind of inside outside and to like regulate that logic. Yeah, so you see like it does, it, it, yeah. you can't develop on top of it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I mean, there is, it, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, no, go on, go on. I was gonna say that, for example, this is for me what really convinced me that this is, this is a good path. Like this, this is uh, Levi Strauss's atom of kinship, right? It says that there is a man who has a sister, and there is another man who has his sister, and this sister marries. So she's the sister of this guy. She's the sister of this guy, and sister one marries man two, and sister two marries man one, and through this, these two guys here establish. A, uh, uh, their own relation, right? So if we take that mother baby thing we were talking about where household relations get value zero, this here is value zero. There, something in them is mapped as if it's talking about both of them at the same time, even though they're separate, right? And the, here as well, the value would be zero. But when S1 marries man two, this has value one. They form like a couple, an interior. And the same on the other side. And in this way, they form here two things, an exterior. So you can actually use this, this tree value logic to define why this is the atom of kinship. So that's yeah. really cool. It's fascinating. It's yeah, really it's, cool. It's really, it's really cool. cool. And you know, because people use... Even... Sorry, yeah? Uh, like I, I was thinking because I, I got to this in a seminar that I was uh, that I was uh, taking a while ago and uh, we, it was a very an entirely different thing but it got to, uh, we got to that same point of like it, we were actually reading Shakespeare and like Coriolanus and it, it has like it's crazy how most of the tragedies rely on that structure in the sense of like uh, with Coriolanus it's the same thing so like you have the this uh, you sort you sort of have these women both, the mother and the wife getting into the way of sovereignty in a lot of ways. So like you have this customary, like this customary kinship connection getting in the way of sovereignty as like the fulfillment of the sovereign task and so on. And like, you have this sort of like disturbancy and this is a like, it's a very, it's a very recurring motive that a lot of people like express. Uh, and, and it's, it, it's usually like not read the, uh, like in tandem with like the the actual social determinations of that it's usually rather right, sort of like this sort of like drama like familial drama but it has this very like i think it has this very social grounding in the clash between modes a and b in a lot of ways and like how yeah, can that's, they that's really interesting be operationalized and count together like this is very cool and you know like now that you said this this is something i really wanted to do uh but look, I'm just, you know, like this would is something that we could imagine as, uh, you know, this is a weird sort of space that has like some resolutions, things are being covered by the same blob, you know, different resolution, they're covered by intersecting blobs. And then, you know, like you need to be able to compose in a way that sometimes two things that already intersected, they again don't have intersection or, you know, like one thing, well, who takes the other? But uh, just two things, like the first is that, you know, like people said that Levi-Strauss was crazy because why didn't he define the atom of kinship as a blood family, right? Like man, female and baby like this. And he said that uh, the atom of kinship requires non-blood relations. 
like so the minimal unit of, of a reciprocal space has both bloodlines and non-bloodline kinship, right? So it's not enough to have like the zero thing. You need to have like some other structure and that's, that forms the minimal unit. Yeah. So we kind of can account for this because this is the minimal unit for you to have all three values kind of stitching together the space, right? But uh, on the topic of Coriolan Coriolanus, what I wanted to say is that I've been obsessing this last couple of days with the idea that uh, we can find good TV series that fit each of these things, you know, like, of course, The Wire, yeah. The Wire is obviously the only one that deals with everything because you can actually, uh, like, obviously... I still have to watch it. I still have to watch uh, it. I don't want to give spoilers, but, like, uh, <laughs> you, you, have, you could write something like this. Uh, this is Barksdale. This is Stringer Bell, for, for people in the know. And this is Marlowe. Uh, like they, you can actually map this. Then I was thinking like this TV series that is making a lot of uh, success now called Succession. Have you guys seen it? Not yet. I'm also like, because uh, I, I was looking into it. You, yeah, you I've, to... I've seen some of it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly about A plus C, right? What is family under capitalistic social forms? Yeah. I mean, I would say like the Sopranos, like how do you keep a community under, you know, the, the pressure of capitalist relations and uh, the um, succession I would put here, you know? Uh, there's probably another one that could go here. I'm not sure which one. Uh, so I, I, I'm sure we could also like cover it with cultural products as well. Like, Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but B I think plus what, C is trickier. Yeah, B plus C, I was thinking like... Uh, I, have, I have one suggestion, which is a really weird movie. Have you guys seen the remake of Godzilla, the Japanese remake? Gojira. Yeah. No. It's a, it's, I really recommend it. Uh, it's a weird movie because it's about like Godzilla. He comes from through the water, like he's a catastrophe, like a natural thing that we produce through our like crazy Anthropocene uh, forces. But you cannot deal with such a monstrous creature through individuals. So 80% of the movie is about meetings that this big bureaucratic organization in Japan has trying to decide what to do about Godzilla. So they say, let's throw, like, you can't decide, let's nuke Godzilla. You need to go through an assembly with experts. They tell you what, what will happen. Then you take that report back to some leader, and then he talks to diplomats. So you can see the state structure trying to answer to this kind of capitalist monster, you know, and trying to be like at the level of it. But I swear to you, like, I'm, I don't know who thought of this movie because it's so in your face that it's trying to, to, to tell that story, you know? Like yeah. the, the individual characters are not that important. We forget their names. They're, the individual dramas are very kind of poorly uh, narrated. Most of it is about this like, big assemblies of a lot of people trying to follow like bureaucratic protocols to, to make collective decisions about how to answer to this huge creature. You know, it's very weird movie. I, I would put it in the B plus C uh, column, but there probably yeah. are other good things. But this is very tricky to visualize now that now that we are talking about it. Like, I think it's very tricky to like, because A plus C is very easy. Like you can be because the, the, I think there there is something about this genre of like uh, family life being disrupted by capitalism uh, by capitalism, which is very frequent even in like uh, I don't know more like even sitcoms and stuff yeah, always true. talk about that. Like I don't know A plus B. I don't know Parks and Recreation is something like it's a very particular way of like. Uh, yeah, it's a really good one. For, yeah, I, I like that. Yeah, in a sitcom <laughs> form, like the A plus B side, in which like you build this sort of like different community because you work in this sort of different place, which is not a like a commodity job, in a way. 
and uh, but also you're treated as someone that should work in a commodity job. Yeah, but BPC exactly. is very weird because I think it's sort of like. Have you seen that series Veep? V? Veep. Uh, it's it's about the the vice president. It's with that woman who used oh, to yeah, do yeah, science. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I'd probably oh. put it here. I don't know. Yeah, it could be something like, I don't know, those dramas like House of Cards could be something of like B plus C in a way. Yeah, it's not about most the family fiction, stuff. Right? It's like- Most fiction has like communities at its center at some yeah. form. But I think Veep in includes that. Yeah, I mean, but but it, yeah, I agree. But like the, the, the individual dramas, like the, the family, I mean, I totally agree that everything that has to do with A is easier to find because Hollywood is like, they know that there's something about the sort of broken existence of reciprocity in our society that makes it the most romantic of modes for all the reasons we were yeah. talking about before, right? So, yeah. I wonder if some of those uh, reality TV shows like Dirty Jobs that have people doing like they're at work and they're, or they're showing different kind of like moments of capitalist life, but they're spectacularized as reality TV. That could be kind of like a B and C. Like they're made into entertainment. Yeah, but yeah, I, I also think you. about sci-fi. Like sci-fi is sort of this genre in which I think that you can find a lot of like B plus C. Uh, uh, like Dune into, is Dune is kind of like B plus C. Yeah, uh, it's, it's also as <laughs> A though with. Uh, yeah, Dune yeah. is probably in the center here. Perhaps. It's in the center. Yeah, Dune is with the wire yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but I could, think a lot it, of dystopias like Brave New World would be B plus C, where there is no real like community connection and like the character interactions are pretty superficial. But you have this massive machine and everyone's playing a like a lot of dystopians, I would agree, or or dystopia stories are B plus C. Yeah, I agree. Black Swan I mean, has a lot or Black Mirror, sorry, has a lot of uh Yeah, Black Mirror is all about B plus C, I'd say. Yeah. I, and it performs B plus C in this very particular way, right? In which like you can get a sort of like, because I think this is the relief of when you watch something like B plus C, because it's usually, first it comes with that like newer aesthetic of like, oh yeah, I'm making a, a unsaturated movie to make you think, but also like it has <laughs> this, uh, it, it has this quality of like sort of detaching you from like being involved in, in it in a way because it shows like such an overstretched version of what you already live that like you can you can actually rest a little bit yeah like what while would, you're at it talking about sci-fi where would you put the matrix like i think the matrix might be like the like this like the wire like but it's yeah i it's, think so yeah i mean it's not really like it Perhaps it's more like A plus B even because uh, like what is, you know, it, it, it kind of empties out the discussion of, I mean, it's not true. Like it gives you a image for exploitation in terms of people are batteries. Like that's not really B, right? That's yeah. more C. So I don't know. I, I, I would put it as a candidate here as well, perhaps. Brazil is a good yeah, would you put Brazil? Yeah, yeah, I like that. But would you put it in the center or would you put it like in I think B? It's B plus B plus C, right? Yeah, probably here, right? Like movies so about like everyone's atomized already, and like yeah, there's exactly. really no community. It's just like you and the bureaucracy, and um, and then yeah, like every day is Christmas. Yeah, I, I tend to think that like movies that romanticize the mode rather than deal with its questions are not really about that mode, right? So Brazil has this sort of romantic idea of connection, you know, and romantic love, but it's so far-fetched and even gets kind of destroyed at the end that it doesn't really deal with yeah. that part. Like, whereas in The Matrix, they do manage to have like, you know, the internet is the like metaphor for protocols. People are batteries and machines rule the world as kind of automation and labor. And then you also have like resentment, envy, 
all those problems of mode A, you know, political co communities having troubles as well, right? Yeah. Which I think is also why it's it's such a kind of classic cultural thing. Like it's hard to pack a, a, all of that into a, a, a kind of sort of world, right? Yeah. yeah, it's hard to do it and not escape into some really crazy metaphor, right? Yeah. yeah. The wire somehow does it without like a metaphor. And the wire is really crazy. The only thing missing from the wire is politics. Like there's no politics in the world of the wire. That's really crazy. Like they don't show any, I mean, they don't show any social movements or, or uh, you know, they don't take seriously that there is anything politically happening. I mean, politics really is a kind of almost miraculous kind of little moment, right? Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. The uh, closest you get is the, the politics within the police department, something like that. Yeah, exactly. I think that like, it has a very Frederick Jameson touch, which is the desire to investigate, you know, the desire to kind of learn about and pull threads. That's kind of mode D. It's like an ethical imperative that will make you asocial, will take you out of your community, will destroy your life, but you can't kind of let it go. So you have like the core policeman having that sort of thing, right? And also like the core guys from the projects, they also like the, the ones that we, like Omar, who's like a nomadic guy, you have like people with a sort of ethical imperative being the only things outside of it, right? Well, to go back to what you brought up earlier about tb gabriel about like um building a place for the perspective of the state for looking like a state that's something that's interesting about shows like the wire and also like true, the first season of true detective which i think is really interesting mm -hmm. is that it is like these are stories that reveal a lot of the world from the perspective of like one of the quintessential agents of the state police right and yeah. particularly investigating police detectives and the privileged space of things like, I mean, I think True Detective is brilliant in looking at the weird social role that um, interrogation plays in today's society. It's kind of weird confessional role and the weird kind of way you build a relationship within that. But it's always, again, under the perspective of TB. And there's something about like the way the wire, it can, it can simultaneously kind of see the whole of K superscript C but because it's from that perspective, that seems also why I can't see any real politics because it is the perspective of the state. It literally, yeah, it's true. Cannot see yeah. the political. Whereas, like TC, like capitalism has always been able to see politics. It just can only see them as something to kind of exploit and, and like take advantage of. TB is just literally like nothing, nothing to yeah. see there. I think Sopranos has this quality of like how it sees politics because it sees politics like. Politics is the background of familial life. So like it's sort of something that like defers the tensions within the familial nucleus. So like you have, for example, like uh, when Meadow goes to the university and she becomes this sort of like uh, liberal uh, rich girl and then she has to face like her own family back. And like you have this, like so you sort of displace the same familial conflict like through a political divergence between both of them. And like, I, th I think that this is like, but also this perspective of, of the of the state, like in shows that are, I think, uh, sort of like protagonized by cops or by any kind of agent of the law. I think this is really interesting. Like even uh, you mentioned True Detective, but also even like uh, stuff like The X-Files, for example, which has, yeah. a huge, I think uh, it has a huge thing on that, how we think. I have a, a friend of mine that she's uh, she's from like this very specific uh fan studies area you know and like they are obsessed with x-files because uh, x-files is the first uh fandom which uh, be, uh, and that became like this very organized and monetized modern fandom like it's sort of the blueprint of like modern fandoms because because it became like both uh a community for like crazy people that were into conspiracy theories and uh, and like also like normal people that just wanted to see like modern scully finally kiss or something or like buy that some version that was me so i watched the whole of x files expecting the moment <laughs> yeah in which they would be happy right yeah and, exactly. but happen. you know now that you say this like this really goes to what you were saying before john about conspiracy because i would put x files here 
because I think, I mean, they they substitute capital for an alien invasion, right? Every time you need to account yeah, for, yeah. for like, why are people being ex exploited, experimented at a bodily level and so on, it's always aliens. So it's a form of domination. So it's yeah. kind of a weird mix of, like, they, they think the parasitic relation of capital to the world in terms of a parasitic form of life dominating the world. So it's mode B. And it has the fetishism of every every weird net every weird effect can be explained by the right network of personal connections, right? Like, yeah. So it's the prototype of of this sort of conspiracy, and it's really amazing too. I watched it again like last year, the whole thing, and it's amazing how ambivalent it is. Like it has this anti-state critique of the military complex in the states, but it already prepares this kind of alt-right, dark, deep deep state kind of conspiracy yeah. kind of grammar. It's already there, you know, but it has a bit more of a, it's really weird because in the first seasons, uh, Mulder is, it's like an anthropologist. Like he's like Eduardo de Vila de Castro. Like everyone yeah. he takes seriously. <laughs> the person says, I saw the werewolf. He says, this is true. You know, it, every cosmology is valid and it's just a different perspective. And he tries all the time to kind of compatibilize it with science, right? And with yeah. study and slowly becomes more conservative as a TV show. It's, it's really weird. Yeah, yeah I think I, I, I really like, uh, sorry, oh, go, uh, ahead. go ahead, John. Oh, no, I was just saying, I, I really like how like uh, in X-Files every Every episode, Scully is skeptical. Every yeah, episode, yeah. <laughs> she's she's proven wrong, and then the next episode, she's still skeptical. Like you just saw werewolves in the previous episode, but now you're gonna say, "Ah, oh, no, this is <laughs> this, this is where I draw is... the line." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like it's funny because it, it's always like I, I don't know her flashlight fails, and then Mulder gets I don't know attacked by some sort of like crazy <laughs> stuff that lurks into pipes. Yeah. And then she only gets there and she's like, I didn't see it. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's wait until the next one. You know, it's I cannot explain this, but also like ho hold on, hold on. But, That's a really but, good point though, because that also kind of like uh uh plays into the caricature of science by conspiracy theorists right now. That you have this yeah. like, because right, she's not actually being scientific, she's continually presented with evidence and she won't change her position. Yeah, she's the greatest right. believer of all. Yeah. Right. And she's yeah. she's depicted as just like an institutional adherent to science, which is exactly how conspiracy theorists see like the you know uh, epidemiologists and vaccine and everything right now is like, oh, this isn't really science. You're just saying it for institutional reasons. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Yeah. It's I mean, true. You know, the really brave thing to do is to just disregard all protocol like Mulder does and just charge in single handedly to a government facility, and you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> somehow there is someone, there is someone there that like will watch you and like they will die, but you will never die. Don't. It's worry. true, Which man. I mean, it's so true, right? Because you do see like right now with the investigations of Jan Six in the United States, there are people in the government that covered for the insurrectionists, so they can say like, oh yeah, no, totally. Like there's like even a trace of reality in there. <laughs> and you know, like it's it's deeply disturbing how Scully then like from what what you guys are thinking. She's the perfect kind of uh, partner to the alt-right. Like it, it mixes misogyny because there is yes, a bit of yes, misogyny yes. in X-Files. Like they play on her stu feminine stubbornness, you know, like they yeah. turn this sort of coldness of a sort of, you know, the FBI bitch kind of thing. It, it, it feeds the skepticism, you know, uh, so, so it, yeah, it goes really to the point. Somebody should write about Scully and the outright. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it, I was thinking about this because like I watched the, the, the whole thing like sort of recently, like this year, I think. And uh, like in, uh, even particularly towards the end, I think there are two things that sort of like put this, uh, like the course of those things to happen. Like, and there, uh, first it's Doggett when he comes, which is sort yeah. of like the, the, this the traditional- The exterminator, form. yeah. Yeah, this sort of like traditional cop that it looks like a, a straight from out of an action movie and like he cannot he cannot fathom what's happening there and like he looks at things and he's like what is this what you guys are doing and like he has this sort of like 
uh, it, it's a skepticism that is very different from like Scully and Mulder because he's sort of he's portrayed as this sort of a simpleton and like a lot of times it's uh, like people mention that oh yeah you're not Oxford educated you know like you're not as smart as Mulder would be you're not the scientist that Scully is. so like this is why you cannot like believe stuff and like you're just stuck into your own like drama and dead son and this type of stuff and then it's like because when it re uh, like when Mulder returns it's impossible like uh, the, the it's the most uh, I don't know plot gymnastics ever made the fact that Mulder is not fully outright like uh, by yeah. the time that like the return happens because he's sort of like he, he involves himself with like the outright and he sort of talks with that guy which is like this famous journalist and uh this type of stuff which is very well played by the way it's a completely disgusting guy and uh and at the same time like th there is a sort of complicity of him with that guy that like a sort of like thing that you you see that there is a common grammar but it's somehow scully never lets him be too crazy so she both yeah. like save him from like himself and she also like becomes the main enabler of the stuff because she's always testing we well, should also, definitely like, write a section of the early seasons but he has to save her almost every episode like there's so many like traditional kind of dynamics like that man like in the first two series seasons she never says her own name by herself like she never introduces herself he introduces her every episode like she doesn't even get yeah. to say her name by herself. Like <laughs> it's yeah, it's really. I, I was watching it with Louise, and she was like, "Do you realize that this woman like two things happen every episode for like three seasons?" He says, "I'm Mother. This is Cully," and second, he tells her to split. You go this way. I go this way. Every fucking episode for like three seasons. Yeah. Before. Yeah. Then That's she gets true. a bit That's more like complicated as a character like her family life comes into it but in the beginning it's like really really absurd i mean we should it definitely have like a, like a, a considered like a, a positive shift from like the 80s cop characters who had just been so overtly misogynist that someone that was like politely misogynist was like yeah i mean it, i think it's it's a really weird series if you think about it like you can see it was influenced. Uh, by the way, where would we put Twin Peaks into this? Oh because yeah, it, it's 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 another Boromian knot. <laughs> <laughs> <Altogether. laughs> yeah, no, but I think it's a sort of a because I, I think I think what makes Twin Peaks alluring is the fact that like you have you you begin from the A plus B problematic, but you stick to the A. Like yeah, finally. I would say Twin Peaks is just here. Yeah. Because it's about community life and like everything that uh, gets abstracted from like those, it's those eerie yeah. towns in which there is no outside structure. Like yeah, only stru and everything can happen. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, it's a personal institution. The the capitalists are personally connected to everyone. Like everyone is personally connected. Yeah, and everything that is too much structure becomes metaphysical, right? If yeah, if there is no abstraction, there is metaphysics, like metaphysical experience. So. If you like policemen who don't only represent communities, they don't represent the state. They represent like a weird existential experience and things like yeah. that. And I also yeah. wonder, I mean, this is something I've been really interested in because I think that uh, there is a weird connection between Twin Peaks and this sort of use of existential dread to signify abstract structure that uh, a lot of the black cultural movement in the States today is using, like Jordan Peele's movies, which use the oh, sort yeah, of Jordan Peele. unease, uh, you know, in the background. He never, it's not about social realism of structural racism. It's about, like Atlanta has the same feeling. Like, it's not about the fact that there is a cop who represents power and you can see the cop doing something bad to you, like realistic depiction of violence is about this weird kind of atmosphere that things can go wrong at any moment. So they like, they politicize L L Lynch's strategy, you know? And like, yeah. it's a big movement. Like you get like Jordan Peele's movies, uh, I think Donald Glover's uh, Atlanta, but in music as well, Kendrick Lamar has a bit of this, like the, there's a kind of weird anti-realist kind of trend 
where there's a lot of atmosphere and a sort of use of the feeling of unease or feeling that there's something abstract, like a vibe, you know, that can be yeah. the stand-in for abstract structure, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think this is very, I, I think this is very interesting. Like I was, uh, there, there was a thing at the news center at some point with Esther Leslie, like she, yeah, I would put a she's the sort, she's the sort of like Benjaminian scholar, like, uh, and, and she, she, she works with like the concept of atmosphere. And so, but she has this very like concrete takes in which like, you, you know, those, it, it she, she's sort of like Mackenzie work in that, you know, like when a uh, matter becomes metaphor and when metaphor becomes matter, so yeah. like the whole kind of vibe of like, uh, and she, she works with that with the concept of like an atmosphere and she has this very like um, trying to see like media structures okay. through these metaphors and like bubbles and foam and like how, how those things get like um, get intertwined and I, and I think that she gets to something around those lines of like what kind of like uh, turbid medias that like cannot be represented through like that, that cannot be like they cannot so solve the puzzle of communication. So what kind of atmosphere do they create in order to like actually try, uh, cover up for that like uh, lack in communication in a way. And I think I think this is really, this is a really cool thing. I think that there is Pally Gritzer's like formal theory of like mathematical theory of vibe also, which is- Yeah, like, it's really interesting stuff. Yeah, it's a crazy thing. I never could get it, but like I, I really like to hear him talk, but it's not something that I know how to manage. And uh, I think there's a lot of like, there's a lot of meat in that. But what I was going to say about Twin Peaks is that, yeah, I, I think I think that it has this quality of like, try, because even the movements, uh, like the moments like uh, in which the FBI is portrayed from the perspective of like the protagonist, it's always like the FBI is this intimate thing which you encounter. Yeah. So, like it's, it's not the agent it's the, your friend albert which comes and he's the yeah, very uh, strict guy and like it's your other friend which because denise which is actually dave duchovny actually <laughs> you know <laughs> I, I would actually define i think that we could define twin peaks as like say what happens when you take the contravarian movement here like what of a exists under kc like because it's not a in pure form right yeah it's like is if you abstract from everything else and look at community, but it's not like fully fledged community. It's like the, just this sort of incomplete state of reciprocity under capitalism. So it's still, let's say, FBI and you know people who deal with factories and things like this. But you remove all the abstract stuff, and then you get this weird. It, so it's almost like you project back onto A, right? Not from A to to yeah. KC, but from KC back to A, like what could you see only in that point of view, right? It's, I mean, it, I, I think, think it is all about that. Like, yeah, I totally I agree. Impression. Because uh, like with Blue Velvet, if you think about it, it's sort of like this, uh, uh, th there is this, uh, it's th this dimension of something like a this eroded family, like from the, like Isabella Rossellini's character yeah. that gets eroded by those outside ambitions. But then what do you get? But, but I think that the good move, move that he gets there is that those, those things never succeed. They always fail terribly. Like yeah. uh, even like when in the end of like, um, like Blue Velvet, like you have the main guy staying with like the main blonde girl, but you have that ravaged, crazy family that stays there and like sort of weaves that very Americana, Americana choreographed style. But like it, it never mends. It, it's yeah. It becomes this sort of like. But I, but I think the other side it. of that is that it's it's also a wrong reading to think that he's like criticizing the American family. Like he really loves it. Yeah. Like I don't yeah. think it's ironic at all, right? I mean. Yeah. He, he just loves it so much that he gets the, he includes into his depiction the fact that it's broken, right? Yeah. In the, in this so it's the full package. Yeah. It's the full package in a way. Yeah. I mean, and this also explains why, you know, Lacanians are obsessed with Lynch because, yeah. I mean, it, it, they, it's kind of the same turf, you know. Like, uh, yeah. We definitely should add a section called film tips, like, Movies, <laughs> TV, like serious suggestions for for our readers. 
yeah yeah the, the, uh, I, th I think it gets it, it gets really like it could be something like actually very simple like from the perspective of uh i don't know uh like jameson's uh ah, how, how does it call that it's not cognitive mapping it's like the other thing that lauren berlin has a whole chapter about it like sort of structure of feeling in a way yeah like exactly games, actually like it, yeah. because I think they they sort of like uh, if we look at movies as like sort of setting uh, structures of feelings for like those modes and like sort of slicing feelings like as yeah. such, I think it's it's a very uh, it's slicing how one feels those structures. I think it's the yeah, man, th that could really work. I mean, I'm actually tempted to. I mean, we could just add like we're not saying much like no TV. Yeah. TV guides, and they just have the diagram with a bunch of uh, of suggestions. Perhaps one line for like we you know, like when you have like short synopses, Karatani yeah. synopses of each thing, and just have it there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Actually, it would, it could be like something. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I'm I'm crazy enough to 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 like that. I'm not sure what everyone would. I mean, it's yeah. theory fiction after all. It would be the, yeah. the fiction of art. Like... <laughs> yeah, we're sort of outsourcing the fiction of art. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> like people are already working within the model. Don't worry. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it would be also a nice hint to Pelly Gritcher because I, I think that his work, like what he thinks vibes are to aesthetic objects, it's very similar to what we're doing with political objects. Like he takes the idea that, you know, there is an objective structure that kind of is able to, is structured in such a way that it's able to, to kind of see a certain collection of cultural things. And that relation he calls a vibe, right? And he uses machine learning so pretty much like categorical cybernetics is just around the corner, but pretty much reparatum, re 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 I don't know how to say that word, but optics pretty much uh, to talk about how you could actually kind of learn and create that model, right? So it's very close, yeah. but for a different area. So perhaps we could even lure him in with something like that. Yeah, I ha I have I I'm like I think two people away from him because like uh, there is Homolo and there's him. So but I can definitely like try to get some hints and, <laughs> and try to see what he thinks about it. I think it would be a good idea, actually. Yeah, it would really be cool. Yeah. Anyway, guys, I, I love that we managed to turn this the last hour into a uh you know a, <laughs> a TV guide. Uh but I'll I'll have to go now. Uh, yeah, same. Hey, real quick, um, I was wondering, I'm going to be gone at an appointment on the 15th, so I was wondering if I could uh, submit a draft before this weekend and go over it next. Yeah, it would be great. I mean, I, mean, I think... Along I, with I, other things, but just like, if we could check that off the list beforehand. Yeah, but what I, what I, I was going to suggest is that we try to have, let's say, drafts of at least some of the sections, like, so that we can read beforehand all of it and then like go yeah. one by one in the meeting, you know, like discuss each of them. So if you have yeah. like four or five of those is already enough for a meeting. Then. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. definitely that'd be good. Great. It'd also be nice, like, you know, to do that thing where if it if you bring something up that someone else is diving into to be able to cross-reference internally. Yeah, I think that, that exactly like if if we have some drafts in that folder, it's easier. For example, I'm doing this with Rafael now, I'm reading his draft. And just suggesting, like, ah, perhaps we can be consistent with the with the terms here, you know, and, or yeah. and things like this. So, cool, great, guys. Yeah, great. All right, All right take, take care, care guys. Take Thanks, care, everyone. Bye. See ya. Bye bye. Bye bye.